Hey everyone! We recently covered the Spectre's Time the Silver Age. Now I'm going to review those comics, and we're going to talk about why ultimately, for two comic book eras in a row, the Spectre just didn't work. Then at the end of this video, I'll talk a bit about this character's future from this point in time, and our coverage of him going forward. Before we get into all of that, be sure to subscribe to Comic Island for more videos about comics, including these in-depth reviews of characters like this one. So for those of you that watched our Golden Age Spectre videos, you'll know that this character was co-created by Jerry Siegel, who is most famously known for co-creating Superman. After creating such a popular and powerful superhero as the Man of Steel, apparently the idea was that the Spectre was supposed to push the limits of a superhero's powers even further. The end result, at least at first in my opinion, very nearly stumbled onto the greatness that is the Spectre. Jerry Siegel and Bernard Bailey had the right idea of how a character this powerful could work in the first two issues that introduced him. For all of his added strength, far greater and limitless than Superman, the Spectre could still be interesting and feature a sense of stakes to him by playing up the dread factor. Early Spectre comics long before the Comics Code Authority was a thing, and featuring the writings of one of the best writers of that time period, were pretty good on the whole because they played up these horror elements. Those first few Spectre comics did understand the Spectre quite well. However, as writing duties changed and the Spectre spread out into the JSA, pretty quickly he was treated like any other superhero. Except he was so powerful and his weaknesses so few and far between, that after the Spectre's initial introduction, very few of the stories featuring him had any sense of stakes to them. Over time in the Golden Age, interest in the Spectre flagged, and DC paired him off with a Scrappy-Doo style sidekick named Percival Pop the Super Cop. It all went downhill from there, to the point that by the time things came to an end for the Spectre, he had been rendered permanently invisible and basically just a sideshow to Percival's story. And Jim Corrigan, along with the Spectre, disappeared entirely without any explanation, astoundingly for over 20 years. I'm not sure how copyright law worked at this time in history, but I suspect DC could have easily lost the character were it not for the fact they decided to try and bring him around, and probably because no one at that time cared enough to try and steal the Spectre. For whatever reason, somebody at the company must have clued in, especially as they started looking back on the JSA, having retroactively assigned Golden Age DC Comics to events all taking place on a different world than the Silver Age comics, which had introduced different versions of characters like Superman and Batman. And so it was revealed that the Spectre had been a hero of Earth 2 all along, and across three issues of the Showcase series, it was detailed and explained how the Spectre was absent for 20 years and had suddenly returned. I was pretty excited going into this thing, expecting that the fresh eyes of the Silver Age writers and artists could really start to give the Spectre the characterization we only ever got hints of in the Golden Age. Unfortunately, that's not at all what we got, and instead, I found the initial Silver Age Showcase comics were functionally identical to the Golden Age Spectre stories. It was alarming to discover, outside of some updated and better preserved art, that nothing had really changed at all. We got the same old stories, which were vague and sprawling, with little sense of stake to them or weight, because of the sheer enormity of the Spectre's power. Luckily, not all of the Silver Age comics were like that. The Spectre's story in the Crisis of Multiple Earths was great, and a lot of fun. That sort of thing was totally new for the character, but an excellent example of the sort of great times that could be had in this particular era of DC Comics. All that stuff, the two Earths colliding, and an unstoppable antimatter being, in hindsight, also felt like a great little hint of what was to come. Similarly, I enjoyed the Brave and the Bold comics, where the Spectre got to team up with Barry Allen and Batman of Earth-1. All of this reflects the sort of writing I would expect from the likes of Gardner Fox and other Silver Age writers. Fox in particular spent a lot of time with the Spectre in the Silver Age, and he's a big name from this time in DC history. And under this climate, DC saw fit to give the Spectre his own solo series, a first given that the Spectre stories were initially published as part of a larger set of books featuring a bunch of different characters. 
This is, in my opinion, where things get really interesting. Gardner Fox did a lot of the writing in the first half of this series, and in spite of his legendary status within comic book history, just like Jerry Siegel, it feels like the same mistakes were being made all over again. Not only that, but we returned to the status quo in the weirdest of ways. Jim Corrigan moved on to a different city, but was still a police officer and basically served the same role he did in the Golden Age. Once again, he was given a fiancé, who was a different woman, and the circumstances they got together in was different, but she basically just stopped showing up. And once again, we got these meaningless stories where the Spectre's powers are hardly even tested, and without any superheroes to balance things out, it just becomes this sort of endless slog of mystical threats that he would conquer time and time again without difficulty. This series only ran for 10 issues, but it does kind of feel like it drags out a bit to me. And then another big name in the world of Silver Age DC Comics came into the picture. A then new artist named Neil Adams started to draw and even write a couple of issues in the Spectre series. And for all of Adams' flaws as a writer in the modern age, he actually did a pretty good job with the Spectre way back in the 1960s. While Adams had hardly perfected the character in the way others would in the future, Neil understood this superhero in a way, for all their talents, Jerry Siegel and Gardner Fox simply did not. Neil Adams was finally able to make the Spectre feel dangerous and terrifying, to the extent you might never know what he would be capable of, and it feels essential for a character this powerful to do something like that. The middle part of the Spectre series really digs into the roots of this character, bringing back Longtime DC villain Psycho Pirate, along with Gat Benson, the man who originally killed Jim Corrigan way back in the 1940s. Along with a bunch of other content introduced during the Spectre's time in the Silver Age, we got this awesome story that really brought everything together concerning the Spectre and all, what he was about up until this point. And it all kind of came together full circle. It left me ready for the character to strike out in a new direction, deeply ingrained in horror and suspense. Any ideas of making the Spectre a traditional superhero basically at this point had been abandoned. People like Neil Adams understood the value in showing a character like the Spectre could not really be trusted to control his powers entirely. And likely in the hopes of trying to keep his powers at least somewhat in check, the Spectre was given a weakness in a pretty complicated story, but one that also signaled the end. Because it was all clearly an attempt to find a place for the Spectre in the world of DC Comics, yet as close as I feel this series got to achieving that, they really didn't quite manage it. Not to mention, behind the scenes, this series very clearly had a lot of problems. For only 10 issues, an awful lot of different writers and artists worked on this thing. And you can really feel that in the quality, where we kind of step back and forth between pushing the Spectre in a new direction and regressing him all the way back to the Golden Age. So, because of all of that, sales once again flagged for a book featuring the Spectre, just like they did in the Golden Age, with too many of the same mistakes being repeated all over again. And just like in the Golden Age, in a final bid to save the Spectre, DC only made things worse. After the Spectre straight up murders a guy, and hey, credit to the writers for really pushing the character in a new direction right up until the end, the Spectre was permanently separated from Jim Corrigan, and effectively made the narrator of what was now essentially a horror anthology series. That lasted for a whole two issues, at which point sales must have imploded because the series was cancelled. I would expect that too, when you advertise a series a certain way, even if it is flagging in sales, changing it this heavily must have really disappointed a lot of fans. A year later, the Spectre was literally dug up out of a tomb for some reason, just so they could kill him off in one final adventure with the JSA. And I did find that final adventure a pretty good send-off that harkened back to his initial adventure in the Crisis of Multiple Earths. But the good news is that even though they killed the character off, this time around DC wasn't going to give up on the Spectre for another 20 years. This time, they would only wait 4 years, until they would try again with a new take on the Spectre. Because while all this was happening, and the Spectre was struggling due to writers at DC essentially having been telling the same type of superhero stories for over 20 years, with nothing having changed since the Spectre's disappearance. Over at Marvel, literally while these Spectre comics were being published, a few fine gentlemen were changing everything we know about the world of comics. DC 
though at this point they had been lagging far behind Marvel in the Silver Age, would soon take notice. In fact, you can kind of see it happening in these later Spectre comics in the Silver Age. And because of that, DC would change quite a bit in the Bronze Age in an attempt to compete with Marvel. As the comics would become more adult-oriented, the power of the Comics Code Authority began to wane, and for a character like the Spectre, that presents a lot of potential. And also, once again, the Spectre would be given some of the biggest names in comics during that particular era at DC. So the question becomes, were big names like Doug Monch, Alan Moore, Marv Wolfman, and George Perez going to be able to tackle the Spectre? Of course, if you can't tell, I am happy to inform you all we will be covering the Bronze Age and the Spectre's time in it. But that being said, his time in the Bronze Age is so vast and sprawling, we're actually going to have to cut it up into two parts, pre-crisis and post-crisis. To that end, stay tuned, because though we will be taking a bit of a break between each era, Jim Corrigan and the Spectre will return in a then-controversial series called Wrath of the Spectre.